I just want us to reflect on what it means to show the Lord's death. It means that we're looking upon his brokenness. We're looking upon everything that he did for us. We're not looking at ourselves. We're not going into ritual. We're not going into indifference. Because that's taking the bread and the wine unworthily. But God tells us to discern his body. And to discern his body is to discern his brokenness. To look at his death. And to acknowledge fully in our hearts what he has done for us. He said, unless you eat of my flesh or drink of my blood, you will not live. There is so much in communion. He said that if we take it unworthily, we'll be weak, we'll be sick, and we'll go to sleep. There is so much when he says, as often as you do this, you are showing my death because you are putting me and yourself in remembrance that I am worthy. My body and the fullness of what I have done is discerned fully by my heart. And in that, I will gain strength and health and I will not sleep. I will wake to life. Because he said, unless you do it, you won't live. Life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. The blood is the cup of the New Testament the new covenant, the blood washes me and you from all sin. To discern it worthily is to not come full of condemnation, is to come knowing I'm a repentant sinner and it washes me from all sin. It cleanses my conscience unto life. It causes me to serve in the newness of the spirit because I've come out of law even the law of sin and death so let's discern the body today let's discern what it really means in our life there's healing in it there's life there's cleansing and washing there's newness and when we drink of the cup let's remember that when Jesus first took that cup that he said, this is the cup of my covenant. But the cup that he took was the third cup of the Passover. It was the cup of blessing. And he turned it into the cup of remembrance. And he's saying, when you take communion, you are taking the cup of blessing because you are remembering what I have done. And there are so many blessings that he wants to release. The blessings of health, the blessing of newness of life, the cleansing I don't even have one myself to take that's why I'm waiting (laughs) thank you (laughs) so let's look at his body but when we're looking at his body we're not looking at the bread we're looking at the this as a symbol of the bread of life we're looking at him showing his death and we're saying I'm showing his death too to my soul to myself, to my flesh, to the devil, and I'm showing his death to the world. So let's take and eat the brokenness. In the name of Jesus, we take and we eat this bread in remembrance of you, Lord, your broken body, in Jesus' name. we drink this cup as the cup of the New Testament we drink it to wash and to cleanse our conscience from dead works Lord to bring us into newness of life so Father as we drink we thank you that it is the cup of blessing in our lives for it washes and makes us clean right now from all sin in in, in remembrance of your covenant Lord So we take and we drink and we thank you for the precious blood of life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That came. It it was like heaven stood still 
And there was that moment in the spirit where it was just quiet. And I think something was engraved in our heart. King of kings and Lord of lords. Not to be taken lightly. No presumption on the grace. It's like a seriousness from heaven. It's all good. It's all good. But it's like a seriousness. Do you understand? King of kings and Lord of lords has stepped into your praise this morning. Someone says, well, nothing's changed, but everything feels different. You know, circumstances don't change, but everything's different when the Lord comes. Circumstances will change, but first we change. So, Father, this morning, whatever it is you're doing, to write deeply in our hearts, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as well as, friend, Buddy, my Jesus. But there's a moment when heaven says, don't forget, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And we acknowledge that truth this morning. We bow before you, Jesus. We don't presume upon your grace and your goodness. We acknowledge it because we've experienced it. But we say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. All glory, all praise be to you, Jesus, this morning. And Lord, because you've stepped into this atmosphere, you've enthroned yourself in our praises this morning. Have your way amongst us. Work miracles, signs and wonders. Change our hearts, our minds, fix up our bodies, relationships, finances. Father, we pray. Oh, in Jesus' mighty name, Jesus' mighty name. We had a brother who came on Friday night. He's only ever been once before. And that was the very last meeting of last year he came. And he came in desperation because of the effects of... uh, alcoholism and the lifestyle that ensured, lost his wife, lost his kids, almost lost his life. He was having up to, I think he said, 170 standard drinks every couple of days. That's a lot of drinking. And it had ruined the lining of his belly and there was, uh, the liver was giving out and everything was wrong on the inside. And he said he just stepped into the atmosphere of heaven and he acknowledged his need and we agreed with him And he said, I couldn't wait to come back after five weeks because he came back with his wife, with his kids, and with a report of being healed. I thought, that's pretty special. That's pretty special. You see, when, when we enthrone the Lord in our praises, you better expect something to happen. You better expect, when you activate the anointing, The first thing he does is look for the need and he heads to the need. Praise God, he doesn't judge the outward deed. He looks to the inner need and he comes to say, how can I help? I thought that was just so fantastic. And I guarantee he'll gossip the gospel. He'll be telling people. He said at the end, I'm going to bring friends. It's got nothing to do with the well, except there's an atmosphere. It's got everything to do with the love of the Father. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let's give our free will offerings this morning for those who tithe, the principle of tithing, not a law, no, nothing legal, legalistic, just freely giving, tithes, offerings, praise gifts, gifts of thanksgiving, and just um, we bless the Lord with <coughs> multiplication of that seed. A couple of notices just to remind you, if you check the updates, that's got relevant information there, February update. We're planning a water baptismal service. Number of people who've been saved who want to get water baptised. Please let one of the leaders know if you need to be water baptised. The healing school starts in a couple of weeks. That's in your notices. Please take note of that. It's a six-week healing school course put on by Without Limits. Six weeks either a Tuesday morning or a Wednesday evening. And that would be a great blessing to get the foundation on the word of healing, so we can minister healing to a, a broken world. And you'd need to register interest in the next week 
so we know how many notes and files to prepare. So there's, I think, a Without Limits desk there at the back. John, is that Without Limits desk there? Please, after the service, indicate your interest. That would be fantastic. Andreas, you want to share about the overflow? Come. Are you happy to do that? A reminder, too, that every third Sunday, which is, of course, our next service, our Community Sunday, uh, we've decided to have a, a picnic in the park after every third Sunday. If you bring and share something uh, for your own lunch, maybe a little, a little bit extra for someone who forgot, and we're going to have fellowship where no one stands alone. Everyone meets people in their regions. We just love one another and just pray that it's not 42 degrees. Um, but that's the third Sunday, and that would be a great blessing. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Yeah, he was quick. That was quick. Yeah. Good answer. You've got to be a doer of the word, mate. <laughs> Hip hop. I had this terrible picture of the spit roast. Sorry, but I thought I'd just drop it in. He said, a German spit roast. I just saw all the German people standing down the roast having a guess what they were doing. <laughs> is, that a, is that what a spit roast is? Well, it moistens it. Yeah. We'll be there. We'll be there. We'll be there. Jeanette said no one will come. That will create great interest. People will come. Hallelujah. God is good. Say with me, God is good. All the time, God is good. If God will do for one man on a Friday night a miracle, God will do it again and again and again and again. Gentleman and his wife drove up from Benja. Benja's on the way down to Harvey, I think, or close to Harvey, somewhere there. And uh, all the way up, he, he told us afterwards he had terrible neck pain, back pain, right down his spine. And uh, just a very simple word of knowledge. Uh, someone had an accident and the Lord was healing them. Well, this guy bolted up to his feet because he felt um, the lightning of God coming right down his neck and back, right down his neck and back. It turned out that he'd had it for... Many, many years, as a young lad, he fell off the back of a ute uh, in, in the farm, I think it must have been, and, and jolted off, fell, and hurt his neck and back, and he's had a problem ever since with much pain. And driving up to Bun from Bunbury, he said, the pain, the pain, the pain. Again, walked into the meeting, word of knowledge, the Holy Spirit fell on him, began to heal, stood up and said, I'm free, I'm healed, I'm delivered. And, you know, I went home thinking about that because I know God has no favourites. God is no respecter of persons, Romans 2.11. What God will do for one, he'll do for another, and he'll multiply it as long as there's faith in the house. As long as someone holds on to that testimony and says, yes, Lord, we believe it. And this morning, I believe there's many of us who hold on to testimonies. Amen? We remember what God has done for us. And our faith releases it, such as we have, we give you. And if you're a visitor this morning, I know there are visitors this morning, we say be thoroughly blessed in Jesus' name. Let today be a day that you remember, not so much us, but the presence of Jesus coming to you at your point of need. This is what's going to win the world. They won't necessarily come to church, but the church will be manifesting the glory in the, in the world and people will find God gravitates to their problem. God is not offended by weakness. God's not offended by problems. He says, I'm looking for the weak. I'm looking for the sick. I'm looking for the addicted. I'm looking for the one who can't make it. I want to show myself strong on your behalf. That's what's happening in the world. I think there'll be more healing outside of church meetings than in church meetings. Well, what's a church meeting? Well, it's just two or more are gathered anyway. So we're going to see a great pouring out of the Spirit all over the city You've got to be in it to win it. You've got to be part of what God's doing. And I felt this morning the Lord lay a certain thing on my heart about staying connected to your destiny. You know, for years we've, we've heard about destiny and most of us understand that uh, according to our identity in Christ, we're destined to do great things for God. But I don't know how many of us stay connected to destiny. It's so easy to be dislodged from destiny, so easy to be sidetracked. So easy to be uh, pulled aside, left or right. And uh, I felt that the Lord said, you've got to learn how to, and for me to learn how to stay connected to destiny. Learn how to keep your heart focused and fixed and established so that you're going ahead all the time in the purpose of God. 
We know that 2013, according to biblical numerics, the number 13 means a time of chaos, time of upheaval, time of rebellion. It's a time where we will see in the in the world uh, greater tension than we've ever seen before. Cheer up, O saints of God. The world is going through that time of sorrows that the scriptures talk about, where the the very um, anguish of of the birth pangs in the physical earth. It's a spiritual phenomenon, but the physical earth is in upheaval. Hence the earthquakes and the floods and the famines. All this is part of what Romans talks about, the groaning of the earth because of of the need for God's children to manifest fully as the sons. And we're in that season. So it's not not that we want to have blinkers on our eyes about what's going to happen in the world. It's going to get rough and there's going to be great problems. 13, chaos. Um, rebellion, upheaval, nations against nations. You're going to see the biggest conflict in the Middle East, as we know. Uh, The fight for Jerusalem, the fight for Israel. And I said on Friday night, I could not believe, and I was reading, and I'm not into politics except I'm into truth, and so you side with truth regardless of political allegiance. And um, President Obama has sanctioned, you know, the... I think it's 70 Spitfire jets to be given to the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt. And their number one agenda is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and also very, very anti-US. And I couldn't help but wonder, when the anointing gets so strong in the body of Christ, the secrets of men's hearts are going to get revealed. Just as 1 Corinthians 14 says, when unbelievers come in and the anointing on the prophetic is so strong that the very secrets are exposed, not to hurt or damage, but for God to heal and deliver. And when I read it, I thought, I wonder if that's the secret of a heart being exposed. And I'm not against anything or anyone except evil. But I do know this, it's going to cause some problems. I mean, it is going to cause some problems. And so 13 in the natural, dreadful, but in God, wonderful. We reminded last meeting, time of intimacy, sitting around the table with the 12 plus Jesus, the 13. It's a time when there will be order out of chaos. It'll be a time when uh, God puts things together out of the scattering that's taken place even in the kingdom. There'll be a unifying of the body of Christ. There'll be greater steps for the church uh, citywide to stand together and be seen to be the body of Christ. So for us, it's wonderful. And when is the, when is the glory seen? The best when things are at the darkest, when everything's dark on the earth and the glory shall be seen. So it's wonderful. I don't want anyone to be thinking, oh, thanks for that. Cheer up, Pastor Phil. Looking forward to a bad year. No, we're going to have a wonderful year. And there's going to be great transference from darkness into light. Uh, Just ordinary, decent people are going to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. They're going to be fed up with what's happening and there'll be no other answer but him. So they're great days for the body of Christ. But I believe it's days for you and me to stay connected to destiny. Our hearts should be so focused on what God has told us to do that uh, come hell or high water, we're going to do it because our faith is proved through some of the trials we go through. Anyone been through trials? Anyone going through trials? Anyone who knows there's a few more coming? But it's all good. I believe that Jesus has illustrated not only in his own personal lifestyle but in the teachings, if you read, sometimes get the old red letter edition of the Bible and just read what Jesus said. You don't have to do that. Uh, but it's a helpful thing to get hold of the words of Jesus and find the emphasis of what he says. One of the things you'll find is this. He actually uh, declares a fairly simple lifestyle. Out of all the complication of chaos and disorder, he brings back a quite a simple lifestyle. A simple focus on God the Father and, of course, the the Godhead, Jesus and the Spirit and the very thing God's called us to do and to live simply and to live carefree. Now, it's not impossible to live carefree. In fact, it's a mandate from heaven. Cast all your cares upon him for he cares about you. A carefree lifestyle. Now, that's not like, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? It is wonderful. Because many of us, I believe, are practicing a carefree lifestyle. Of course, the cares will come. They'll knock on the door and some of them will get back in. But when you wake up to it, you cast that care again on the Lord for he cares about you. And a carefree lifestyle 
is a simple lifestyle. You're free to rejoice. You're free to interpret everything uh, by the Spirit. You know that it's all working for good for those who love God and called according to His purpose. And even though some of the things are very awful in the natural, in God we can find a strength and a grace to go through it and still smile all the way through. God doesn't add sorrow with his word, with his commandments. Who, who wants a simple lifestyle? Of course we do. Who wants carefree lifestyle? You can have it. It's all part of the uh, gospel. It's a choice we make today. But we have to guard our heart. Proverbs 4, just a, a few scriptures here this morning. Let's, let's allow the word to work, change us, pull out things that aren't good and plant the truth. It's incorruptible seed. Proverbs chapter 4, the emphasis here is guarding your heart with all diligence. You and I are custodians of our own heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes and keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life or the forces of life. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence. So we are custodians of our own heart. No one else has access to our heart primarily except us and that which we allow to come into our heart. And it's one of the, one of the greatest Christian disciplines, I believe, is to guard your heart. And it says with all diligence, because it's going to take all diligence to guard, because... Remember the world chaos, unrest, upheaval, disorder, rebellion. That atmosphere surrounds us in the sense that it's just there. It's a breath away. Uh, but we who are choosing to walk in the Lord and in the glory of the Lord, we are guarding our hearts so these uh, things do not have uh, undue influence over us uh, and, and block our faith and block our uh, relationship with God. They're designed to, to detract and distract but I believe we're getting very wise now in these last days. Guard your heart with all diligence, for all the issues of life flow forth like rivers from that one central location, our heart. Everything pertaining to life comes out of the heart, but sadly things that can cause death and destruction also, if they're allowed in, will begin to flow out of our heart as well. So we need to guard our heart with all diligence. Uh, what, I, what I felt we were doing with the children today, we were putting boundaries around them in the spirit, we were saying off limits to the enemy. We are saying they're under our protection, our authority, especially as parents. But I know that there were families here with, with foster children and, well, they're, your, they're also given the same grace as your natural children would be given and you can love them and look after them and they're protected and kept by the power of God. If we pray, if my people will pray, humble themselves, forsake their wicked ways, seek my face, then I'll come and heal even the whole land God wants to do that. He wants Australia to be on fire with revival. But it's got to start in our heart and we have to guard our heart. I believe you and I are at the crossroads every day with the choices we make. And here's the crossroad. And when it came to me, I thought it was strange language, but it's the crossroads between mystery and revelation. Mystery, the things we don't understand, the things we don't know, the consequences we're not aware of, and yet also the revelation of God, the word of God. What has God said? What are the promises? What are the warnings? Uh, significant choices that we make on a daily basis form the crossroad. Do I just go with the unknown and say, oh, well, I'll take a chance. I'll just try it. Every, everyone else is doing it. The media uh, you know, says it's the way to go. I think I'll just make a choice in that direction. Whenever there's a choice between what you don't know and what you do know, that which is from God, and if you know it, do it. That's the end of the choice. I, I'm, as for me in my house, we're going with God. We're agreeing with the word of God. The inner focus of my heart is not the mystery of the unknown. It's the revelation that I already know. If you and I walked in what we already know, you wouldn't have to worry too much about what we don't know because what we know is so much more in the sense of God has revealed and revealed and revealed and he's spoken and he's confirmed and he's prophesied and what else does he have to do? It's like a parent that says, how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> yeah, a nine-year-old son, ten-year-old son and daughter. How many times does mother have to tell you? Well, I think God must feel the same sometimes, except he's pure love, so he's not going to belt us up or anything. But really, he tries to warn us. He says there's consequences for the choices. You've got to guard your heart. 
as soon as you tap into uh, the wrong uh, flow, that thing is still going to flow. You're not automatically protected. The choices will keep you in that flow of God or it'll cause us to go to where there's uh, destruction and death. So daily at the crossroads, the place between faith and fear, the decision between trust or lack of trust, uh, facing the problem or the, or, or the promise every day. I said on Friday night that um, my niece's husband just had a very bad report, medical report, and it's a very bad report. And he, he's only a young, youngish man in his probably late 30s, maybe 40-ish. Two beautiful little kids. Terrible report. He's been through sort of a stage of this before. And praise God he came through, but now it's come with a vengeance. So as soon as, you know, you get the phone call and it's all, you know, tears and so on at one end and I'm at the other end and basically the call is do something, do something. I'm thinking, do something, do something. Uh, you know, I mean, I've got a choice now as to how I respond. Yeah? Choice. Yeah. Immediately you can, you can feel I've got the choice to panic and go down this track, get the fear, lose the faith, lose the trust, uh, let that report be bigger than the promise, let the problem become bigger than the promise. And I, I think I might have passed the test. I sort of slipped into it for no more than about 10 seconds. And I thought, I ain't thinking that. I ain't going down that track. I'm not going to give this any place in my heart. And I was able to switch back and make a choice. I felt the Lord give me some good promises. One of the promises I felt was the scripture, 1 Samuel 16. Now, who in their right mind, unless you're a wonderful Bible scholar, would automatically know what's in 1 Samuel 16? I didn't have a clue. Hard enough to find where Samuel is. But anyway, we found him. Looking up chapter 16 and reading through, and there it was. Arise, go and anoint David. For my favour will be on him. Have a guess what? His name's David. I mean, it couldn't be more spot on. Arise, go and anoint David. So there I know is the saving grace. But the choice is, oh, could be embarrassing, may not be received, shall I do it? Or obedience, arise and go and do it. Choices. See, but if you guard your heart, you connect to destiny. Our destiny is so wonderful. Christ-likeness, miracle power, overcoming strength. What about unbroken victory? Who'd like that? Well, that's our inheritance. Unbroken peace. No disturbance of peace. Fullness of joy. <laughs> Fullness of joy. I'm in Corrie Ten Boom in the middle of prison saying, God, please don't give me any more joy. I can't take any more joy. <laughs> what? That's her testimony. In prison. Sister had been raped and all these dreadful things and she's begging God, please, no more joy. I'll burst if you give me... When I first read that, I mean, I thought, this is crazy. Wonderfully crazy. Wonderfully crazy. Then I realised God is no respecter. Fullness of joy actually is your portion. My portion. I don't want to be a grumpy old man. Sometimes I think I've probably already ended into it, but I'm pulling back out of it real quick. Because you've got the choice of how to react or respond on a daily basis. Now, it may not seem important, except your heart is either connected to your destiny or at that point of, of uh, failure, it's disconnected from destiny. That's the seriousness of it. There's a consequence every time the heart focuses on that which is not of God. As soon as the heart focuses on the problem, you got yourself a problem. And the more you look at it, the bigger it gets. The closer you get to the mountain, the taller the mountain is. The closer Israel got to the walls of Jericho, those walls, those 50-foot, 60-foot walls were getting higher and higher. The closer they got, the bigger the problem. The closer they got, the bigger the problem. But the focus was on doing what the promise was, everywhere your feet tread, everywhere your feet tread. And they won the battle of Jericho against all odds. Fortified city. And just this group of pilgrims coming out of the wilderness, leaning on the beloved, le learning to trust, What's the promise? Wherever your feet tread. So Joshua, with courage, made a decision. I'm not panicking. I know that the enemy's there. I know they're watching us. I know they've got the, uh, the armaments aimed against us, but God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And off they went marching round. No one's allowed to talk. Biggest miracle of the whole of biblical history. Everyone's mouth was shut. I pray that anointing comes on many of us more often. 
Do you know that God is prophetically dealing with the spirit of leprosy in the church? I read it recently just with an article someone gave me, but I've heard it before. In 2013, God will deal with leprosy in the church. And I thought, leprosy in the church? What is that? And prophetically, it, it was about the, uh, the misuse of our tongue, the, the speaking out of order, uh, complaining and gossiping and all that kind of stuff that really does quite easily get hold of many of us. And, uh, you know, in the days of those who were lepers, they actually had to cover their lip with a cloth. And as they covered their mouth, they were only allowed to say one word. You know what that one word was? Unclean, 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 unclean. And the prophets were declaring that the church has had a lot of uncleanness in the sense of the negative talk. Now, John 15 says we're clean by the word. So unclean means whatever's not true, whatever's not the word, whatever's not right. It's not just a moral impurity. Uncleanness is whatever's not clean. John 15, you're clean by the word. Praise God you and I are clean this morning. Washed by the blood, cleansed by the word. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful news? We're clean this morning. God says you're clean this morning, covered in the robe of righteousness, washed in the blood of Christ. Uh, you know, your sins were scarlet, but now they're white as snow. I mean, that ought to send us ballistic around the room. Well, it probably won't, but it could. You know, I see extreme expressions of praise and I think it's rather, I think it's rather fun. Someone said to me, big criticism, Pastor Phil, you allow strange things to happen, don't you? I said, not as strange as what's about to happen. <laughs> because when extreme worshippers get hold of an extreme miracle, there's no way you're going to sit politely being religious and saying, thank you, God. You're going to get up and you're going to scream and shout and jump as is happening all over the world. Gentleman I know got up and started saying praise the Lord in one of the cathedrals where the ushers came up to him and said, excuse me, sir, we don't praise the Lord in this church. <laughs> I don't think they meant they don't praise the Lord. We just don't quite do it in that style. He said, but I was so full of God. I was so full of the Holy Ghost. I was so excited about my salvation. I forgot I was in a tradition that didn't do it. I just did it. And all he did was praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That's hardly radical. I mean, that's hardly extreme. Do you know that we've got a generation of young people who God is going to reach and they're going to be extreme believers? They're not going to conform easily to religious tradition and neither do they have to. Hallelujah. They're just going to get their hearts focused on Jesus and they're going to hear the word and I believe they're going to do it. And in a, in a dream I had, I saw young people and they had passports and they had tickets, but I noticed this in the dream. The tickets were one way. And I thought, Lord, what is, you know, my, my reasoning was, what is this? Well, I'm sending them out and they're going out without any view of returning back to home comfort. They're just going to go and do the assignment I put before them. Some of them will go and be martyred. This was in a dream. And there was thousands of young people. You know, when they hear the extreme message of go into all the world, they're not going to spend five years at a theological seminary understand the Greek origins of the word go. <laughs> They're going to say, go, I'm arising and I'm going. See you later, mum and dad, I'm off. That's what's going to happen. That's an extreme anointing that's coming on the church. The whole status quo thing's shaken. Hallelujah. I mean, smile, that's a good thing. We want, to, we want to be flooded with new believers who are radically saved and radically healed and radically in service for Jesus. Amen. Say amen. Oh, well, you don't have to say amen. I just suggest. Say amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Because some of them will be your sons and your daughters who hate church, hate religion, but they don't mind truth. Tell us the truth and we'll have it. You know, today's kids are extreme. They hate hypocrisy. They hate the church trying to pretend to be something it's not. They don't fall for our attempts to have fancy programs. They're not impressed by our, by our feeble light shows. You know, we've got one strobe and one glass ball that goes around. These kids have seen the most sophisticated. They've seen the best. They've had, they've had experiences with what the world can offer and they ain't going to fall for a substitute. What they're going to say is, if your God is with you, let your God manifest, let him come to me, let him speak to me, let him help me in my time of need. That's what they're looking for. I'm speaking to pastors who have some of the fanciest shows on earth. 
One of them I spoke to. <laughs> the fanciest show, he says, Phil, it's all in the program. I said, no, it's all in the presence. And he, he said, you know what? I know that's true. He says, because the same kids who come into church for a program will spend the, night, the next five nights in a nightclub with a better program. Better in the sense of more sophisticated and whatever. He knows it. He got it. I said, what about just to just an ounce of his presence rather than anything else? Extreme kids want extreme experiences. They want to have huge encounters with God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. That's why some of the behaviors are extreme and some of the dress codes and things. Don't worry about it. Just let God work at the heart. If our internal reality is my destiny in Jesus, then we will go for it. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, that's how the man is. The spiritual perception of the inner man. First Ephesians 1, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your understanding. That's what the heart is. It's the eyes of the inner man. It's that spiritual perception that comes from the heart. We need to be so focused. We need to so understand and perceive accurately what God is saying. Do you know, whatever we look at, we become like. You, you, whatever you behold, you're changed into. And uh, I was thinking of one of the Psalms. It says, Lord, as I behold you, I wake up in your likeness. As I behold you, I wake up in your likeness. The same is true for the negative we behold it and look at it and play with it uh, we'll be changed to be like it stay connected with destiny by keeping the focus of the heart I want to just spend a few minutes considering King David King David's a bit of a hero allowed to have heroes well put it this way good examples now David you know is still a broken man David messed up David doesn't have an unblemished record but you know the wonderful thing of scripture says this God God knows we're not faultless but he calls us blameless and he'll present us blameless before the father i find that one of the most beautiful things he says son you weren't faultless but i call you blameless because jesus took the blame and jesus took the shame isn't that fantastic isn't that a message for extreme young people who know they say one of the strongest spirits upon uh, these extreme kids and I've heard this from psychologists and others too, one of the, one of the spirits on them is shame. They, they feel this inner tension causes shame because we can't do this and we don't fit there and we don't have the normal stereotypical family and we, we, we don't measure up to this and we don't fit in churches and all this inner tension creates a sense of failure, a sense of failure, which is why so many won't even look you in the eye. It's not that they're evil, it's just that they feel shamed and I failed and I don't fit in and I don't accept society's values and I think differently and I hate corporate greed and I don't like... You know, this, is, this is the generation, the digital, digital mob. They don't fall for all the stuff that you and I were sort of brought up with. It's different, it's, it's changed. But I believe the deepest longing of their heart is to be loved and wanted and accepted and to know in Jesus you've been adopted into the family, you've been accepted, you're pronounced clean, you're blameless, you can start again. There's grace that will come upon you to heal you and deliver you and change you. They, they want to hear that. They would love to hear that. The only reason, I mean, some of them in the streets who've got their little peer groups around them, they all think the same, they look the same. They say, well, well we're very different, but in fact they're identical to all the ones around them. So it's quite hilarious all on its own. But you know what they're finding? Comfort. They're finding acceptance. They're finding, well, they think like I think. I fit there. They, they ought to fit with us. They ought to fit with us in terms of mindset. You're loved. You're wanted. You're accepted. You're not alienated from God. God's for you. God's with you. We're your family. We're your mums and dads. That'll freak them out. We want to love you. We want to look after you. Have you got accommodation? Do you need a job? Do you need food? When they feel that's the culture of the kingdom of God, you won't keep them out. They don't have to come to formal meetings, but they will want to connect with our hearts. I believe this is a strategy when revival comes. Acts chapter 2 says they had all things in common. They were able to give liberally because God was flooding more and more grace into their lives. King David is such an example and such a picture. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. What's the great statement there? Anyone has it a guess or anyone know what it is? How is he remembered? As a man, after 
God's heart. When he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill my will. That's the great legacy of David. It's not the only legacy, but that's one of them. Remember David, a man after God's heart. Why was he after God's heart? Number one, whilst he was in obscurity, whilst he was on the backside of the desert, his, his personal lifestyle was worshipping God, praising Jesus. And that's extreme. That's extreme. David, in his private life, learned to worship God and love God. No audience except the sheep, and they didn't appreciate it. There was no one clapping him because he was the leader, he was the pastor, he was out front doing his thing. He did it to the audience of one. This is why God says, he's got a heart after me. He's got a heart just like my heart, a heart of... uh, of desiring to give and give and give. And you know the Psalms are a legacy so much from David and uh, the things that David did set him apart from so many others. He was pouring out his heart in worship. I love that about David. He stood out before God. I said before there was a massive paradigm shift because Israel only knew one form of worship. Up until that point, Israel only knew how to sacrifice animals so the blood of the animal would be a, a covering for sin for a season, just a temporary measure. You know that, the, the, the Old Testament sacrifice is just a measure of covering the sin for a season till the high priest did it again. That was the accepted form of worship. That was the revelation they walked to. Now David forsook even the letter of the law by seeking the heart of God. He, he was prepared to be different. I mean, David established the tabernacle of David And the thing of the tabernacle of David was where he instituted the free worship, where there was no veil, where there was no separation, where there was no distinction of of, of priest and and, and those who were in in the congregations. We were all one, all had access, men and women, and everybody could come and worship God. That's huge. That's huge. Which is why David's life has also got the other side of persecution and opposition and resistance and death threats and betrayal. So here's here's the thing. If you and I stay connected to destiny, praise God on one side and watch out on the other side. Because the enemy will not allow you just to continue without him at least opposing. Understand it, just don't worry, don't panic, the grace is always sufficient. Uh, but if you want that perfect ride in ministry without any opposition, you won't have it. There's no such thing. Because the crossroads mean uh, there is an agenda on this side and there's an agenda on this side. And if you choose God's agenda, then the grace will be sufficient. Do you know that uh, Luke 2.52 says that Jesus grew in stature and he grew in grace. Now, now someone needs to smack me and say, Pastor Phil, you're a naughty boy. You can do it. Say I'm a naughty boy. So I've never had the revelation that I knew growing in stature, but I, I missed the bit about he grew in favour. I know everyone else got it. I know you've known it for years. I know you pray like that. But all of a sudden, boom, I got it. He grew in favour. It wasn't just an automatic thing, with, even though the doctrine is you have favour. He actually grew in that release of favour because of his obedience to the call upon his life. This is Jesus. If Jesus has to grow in favour, then even though we have favour, you've got to grow into that favour. You know, there's enormous favour on King David when he's, when he's king. But you know, Samuel anointed David to be king uh, at least a minimum of 10 years before he actually took position as king. Ten years. Have a guess what happened in the ten years? Opposition, persecution, strife. What was God doing in the ten years? Proving his heart. Allowing the tests to see whether the added grace would be deserved in that sense. It, has he, is he going to handle the added grace because of the added problem? Because if David was anointed by Samuel to be king and then he became king in seven days' time, there's not enough grace on his life to handle the position. 
He had the grace to grow. He had the grace to get the lion. He had the grace to get the bear. He had the grace to progressively move towards his destiny. And this is what I find so sad. So many people do not move towards their destiny. They'll, they'll talk about destiny and one day, Pastor Phil, I'll be in ministry. One day I'll save the world for Jesus. Well, you can't even do your shoelaces up today. You're not going to have the added grace to go and save the world for Jesus, except in your pipe dreams. I'm not speaking to anyone. I'm speaking to the way I used to think as a young man. You know, you have a little bit of anointing on your life and all of a sudden you think, you're God's too, I see. Oh God, you can trust me. I'll handle anything. Then he throws a little test your way to see whether in fact he can trust you and, and you make a crazy choice with terrible consequences. You blame God for not fulfilling the prophetic word. God, you promised. God, you said you'd do it. No, you, son, you've got to grow in stature. You've got to grow in the favour. It's there and it's sufficient and I won't give you a test beyond what you can handle. It's because I know you can handle it, son. I'm barracking for you. God is with you. I'm for you. Come on, come on. But you've got to rise up with responsibility. No, 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 I don't want that. I want to be the king. Well, you can't be the king. You can't be trusted to be the king. You're going to make decisions that will ruin everybody's life if you become the king. Saul was, Saul was escalated to his kingly position in a very short time. And yet he was the man for the job. Scripture says that Saul was the man who was right for the position, but he did not allow God to groom his heart to fulfill and remain in that anointing. He, he bungled it very, in a very short time. And finally, possessed with a murderous spirit. Oh, yeah, but he was anointed. Yeah, he was anointed. He's made a series of silly choices. Now look at the end result. People say, no, no, God doesn't let it happen. God can't stop it from happening because he gives you the authority, gives me the authority to make the choice, to stand at the crossroads and say, which way, son? Now I'm here to help you. Which way? You choose. Yeah? Yeah, it's wonderful. Free choice is wonderful. Just choose well. Oh, man, some people need cheering up this morning. Don't feel sad. 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 But here is one of the great tests I feel David had. He had lots of tests. (laughs) Oh, dear. When I think of some of our testimonies, who's had lots of tests? Lots of trials. Put your hand up if you've had lots of tests. Lots of trials. Some of them pretty dreadful. Some of the situations are shocking. You couldn't, pr- you couldn't prove your heart to anybody. You, you, ha- you copped the flag. But let me say this, you weren't faultless, but you're not blameless. You know, they rejected David's leadership. They rejected David's leadership. The enemies rejected David's leadership. Now, when the enemy rejects you, when Satan rejects you, you're having a bad day. Satan normally will accept anything. But he opposed David all the way because he knew who David was and he knew David's heart. But have a guess, David's first wonderful congregation. You tell me who they were. (laughs) Well, apart from the sheep. (laughs) All those who are in debt. All those who are in distress. All those who are discontent. Can you imagine a church full of discontented people? Hiding in a cave, running from the enemy and all plonked together and there's David, the king, anointed to be the king. He says, oh, but I've got this lot. God will prove your heart for ministry the way you handle the weakest of the people. Your attitude towards the broken. I know many a leader who says, I don't want that kind of person in my church. I'm thinking, what the heck is that all about? What you've done is reveal the secret of your heart that you're worse than that kind of person because you should be a man after God's heart. God will test all of us on that. Jeanette and I are going to write a book called Characters of the Kingdom. I tell you, there are thousands of them and of which we sh- I'm sure we are too. Characters of the Kingdom. People want perfect congregations with instant maturity, no such thing. God will prove your heart with a grace grower. He'll prove your heart with someone who's going to resist. He'll prove your heart with a discontented parishioner. He'll prove your heart with someone who's just not 
towing the line. It won't last forever, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Because the anointing on David to be king was anointing to lead the people to their destiny. So he started to teach and lead by example and by principle. And before long, have a guess what he had? Mighty men. He had mighty men. And that's what's happening in the body of Christ. Many have ended in broken. Many have ended in discontent, debt, sad, depressed, broken. Barely made it to Jesus. But I tell you what, you hear the word, you sit under the right anointing before long, you'll rise up. I'm a mighty warrior. Why? Because I kept my heart connected to my destiny. I kept doing my best to make the right choice. You won't make perfect choices, but the attitude of heart is, Lord, I'm focused on what you say. I'm at the crossroads. Satan has an agenda. God, you've got a wonderful purpose and plan. I'm not going to fall for this all the time. I used to, no more. I'm coming according to your word. Let it be unto me. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not that bad. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to finish with this. David's legacy. You and I are called to leave a legacy. Not only to our own family, but the generation to come. They ought to look at us and say, look how these radical people did it. The true significance of David's promotion, final promotion to be the king, was his ability to reign on the throne, the throne of David. I mean, it's stunning enough that he wrote the Psalms. That's an incredible legacy for the whole world, generation after generation. It's wonderful enough that he had a new form of worship where everybody was free to enter into the presence of Jesus. That's an incredible legacy. It's pretty wonderful that he designed the temple. It's pretty wonderful that he brought Israel into a golden age politically and economically and they flourished under his reign. Remember, his heart was right. So God was just pouring through him. Not only is that wonderful, but the very lineage of of Jesus now acknowledges King David and his throne so that even Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David, he came from that kind of example of a king. Jesus called son of David. What a legacy. Oh, well, he was just born privileged. No, he wasn't. Well, he didn't make big mistakes. Yes, he did. Well, he had an audience that flattered him. No, he didn't. He had the sheep. He was thrown out from popularity, but his heart said, I'm moving towards God's agenda. Hallelujah, Jehovah, I give you glory. Just between you and me, Lord, I want to tell you, I love you, Lord. He did that for years. God proved his heart. He said, he's outstanding not just outstanding in the field. He's, he, is, he is something else. Would you like the Lord to look across the congregation today and say to you, you are fantastic. Now, he's going to tell all of us he loves us, but he may not be happy with all of us. He may not be pleased. He doesn't like those who shrink back. He loves them, but doesn't like the shrinking back. Well... Let's not shrink back. Let's go forward. Let's arise and go forth. 2013, chaos, so what? Rebellion, so what? We'll be in obedience. I believe multitudes are watching. They're coming. Your sons, your daughters, your families, your neighbours, your friends. But let God give you the promotion. Let God give you that incremental. It doesn't have to be as long as maybe it took David. There are, there are new anointings that are taking a shorter time to have effect but it still reflects the condition of the heart. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to put my hand on my heart and say, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, finish the good work, Lord. I'm going to guard my heart. I'm going to, with all diligence, not allow sewage and rubbish to enter in. Keep myself pure. But, Father, it's not by mind or power, it's by your Spirit. Without you, we cannot do this, Lord. And so we, the beginning of the year again, we say thank you for your help. My help is from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
And some of you might want to do this. You don't have to. I'm going to pat myself on the back and I'm going to encourage myself. <laughs> encourage you, son. Come on. It's a bit corny. Don't worry. Don't look. Don't even watch. But I'm encouraging myself. In case anyone else to, forgets to encourage us, I am encouraging myself. The Bible says David strengthened himself and David encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, good choice, son, good choice. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So, Father, let's again agree for the one next to us, the anointing, the power, the glory, greater encounter in Jesus' name. Anyone who, who felt God very much speaking to them about the choices and about the agenda of God and you'd like some agreement prayer, just come, we'll pray for you. We'll pray that 2013 is a, a bumper year for you. Come, as many who want to. You might be at one in debt and in distress. Just come. Some of the team get ready. We'll come and just pray for these ones. Don't, don't hold back. Don't be shy. There's an anointing present from that word to help you. Come, those who just need encouragement with prayer this morning. And what's the prayer? Keep connected to destiny. In some cases, reconnect with your destiny. Come, as many who want to come and pray. So anyone who's never given their life to Christ, then this morning you say, I'm ready to do that. Just raise your hand if you've never committed your life to Christ. And today you say, I'm ready to make that commitment. Anyone not sure? Anyone not sure of their commitment to Christ? Anyone not baptised in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues? You desire that today. Is there anyone? We'd love to pray for you. Okay. After the meeting, stay for fellowship. We've got some hot dogs today. Just when it's 40 degrees, we thought we'd go hot dogs. Stay for a bite, stay for... I think there's some cool drink, fresh cold drink somewhere there. Hallelujah. Thanks, guys, musos. Go for it.